Senator Professor Emeritus Sir Henry Fraser, Dean Adams, fellow faculty Dr. Morris, Dr. Umagor, Dr. Joseph Herbert, and the, some of my other colleagues in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, students of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this decanal lecture in the university's 50th anniversary in, of independence celebration. The faculty is very excited to be part of the campus's celebration. And as part of that contribution, uh, we will have a monthly lecture which began in January. So this is January's lecture. Uh, and we'll continue this month and every month, except I think for one, and we'll finish in grand style in November with, by, with a lecture from Professor Fraser. I am going to remind you, for those who have just entered, again, to make sure your mobile phones are on silent or are turned off, and also uh, that we are being recorded. I will first call on Dr. Euclid Morris to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Good evening. Uh, Dean Emeritus, Professor Sir Henry Fraser, uh, other members of the faculty, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you good evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this evening uh, the current Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, uh, Dr. Peter Adams, who has been a uh, medical practitioner for some 30 years. It's aging him a bit, you see. Um, Professor uh, Dr. Adams, he did a first degree at Imperial College in London in biochemistry, and then went on to do his medical studies at University uh, uh, the West Indies, Mona, and then to finish in at the Cayfield campus in Barbados. He completed the MBBS degree and after a two year internship in Trinidad at the Port of Spain uh, General Hospital, he moved to Barbados and ba back in those days, internship was two years. And so pretty much after you finished your internship, you were equipped to manage most things that you would see uh, in general practice. He came down to the Eastern Caribbean and the Barbados where he settled and was enrolled in the family medicine program where he completed with distinction the DM in family medicine. He then continued to work and I remember myself, uh, uh, Dr. Hoyas, who was then the, the head of the family medicine program those years ago. And Peter Adams was then appointed as head of family medicine program in 2002, and that was after uh, Dr. Hoyas had, had, had moved on. He has since introduced a diploma in family medicine by distance, so we've got doctors from across the Caribbean. Um, he's an associate consultant at the Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and heads the said uh, general practice unit at Wildey and the Edgar, the Edgar Cochran Polyclinic. Dr. Adams is a former editor of the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners Bulletin, and he's currently a member of the International Advisory Board of the British Journal of General Practice. He brings years and years of experience on the topics of obesity, hypertension, and all chronic diseases. In 2009, Dr. Adams received the Caribbean College of Family Physicians uh, President's Award for dedicated service in the field of medicine and to the CCFP. And in 2012, he received the Principal's Award for Excellence at Cave Hill. He was appointed Dean in August of 2015. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, and now Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, Dr. Peter Adams, to talk to you about obesity. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, from that introduction, you see the um, 
University of West Indies has been active in medical education in Barbados for quite a number of years because I've been in practice 30 years, you said, and two years internship, and I've been here two years before that. So it's, it's over 34 years I came and found, the place, found it in action. And tonight, we're going to talk about a, a big problem that's getting bigger. You'll say, well, we haven't solved it, but we've certainly been studying it. Um, obesity prevalence, perceptions, and personalized care. Um, it's, it's a talk designed for the general public. Um, and so before we start any presentation, we should define what we're talking about. Um, to give us some context. We need to speak about why, why worry with obesity. Um, we'd have to just mention some of the health hazards. Um, and in the highlight of the presentation, um, prevalence, which is how much of it do we have, perception, um, and um, why perception matters, and personalized care, which is the last part. So the obesity definition, in, in, in the surface of it, it's quite simple. Obesity is excess fat. But there are two problems here. Um, excess fat cannot be measured directly. And how much excess is excess? And um, medical researchers and physicians have struggled with this over the years, and definitions have changed over time. And because definitions have changed over time, um, there has been some difficulty in um, comparing older studies with newer studies. In the um, 50s, 60s, 70s, especially, sex-specific weight for height tables were used. Um, and they were the common standards before 1980. And they were based on data life insurance companies had collected in USA and Canada. You enroll for life insurance. They saw how long you lived. They saw what um, weight for height had the um, lowest mortality, and they set out their tables. Usually it was a range, and if you're 20% over that weight, you were at some increased risk. But in 1835, a Belgian, Lambert Adolphe Ketelet, he was the head of the observatory in Brussels, Belgium. He was an astronomer, a mathematician, statistician, and social scientist, sociologist. In those days, of course, you could be quite an all-rounder. You didn't specialize and super-specialize and sub-specialize until you knew a lot of almost nothing. But it was quite broad. But he came up with the BMI, which is what we use today. This is weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So this is a formula using weight and height and dividing it, and you come up with a, with a a body mass index. A one figure, you can use the same value. We don't have to go to tables. We can just use the cutoff points in BMI. He, was, he studied a lot of different things, and he came up with normal ranges. So there are two ways of looking at what's normal or, or looking at standards. You can say what's normal. So you can look in this room, and you can, you can weigh everyone up and take an average. And that average, and, and a little bit on either side of that average, is normal. But if you use that criterion in a very obese population, then normal would be somewhere in the obese range. And that's not going to be very sensible. And then if you look at the other part of it, um, well, why, why does that matter? You know, you'd have, it matters when you can get a cutoff point over which there's a certain amount of increased illness or death. So researchers started using. Uh, um, guideline makers started using this in the 80s. For example, in the 1980s, the U.S. dietary guidelines used acceptable BMI, um, which was, uh, they had body mass cutoffs, slightly different from men and women, and they're there in, they're, and they're in the slide here. In 1985, they changed them a little bit. In 1987, the World Health Organization brought in um, the definition we now use normal weight, a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9. And I'm going, to sh I'm going to give you an example what these things actually mean a little later. 
overweight 25 to 29.9, and obese um, over 30. Um, and this was a headline on 17 of June in 1998 by CNN. Millions of Americans became fat Wednesday, even if they didn't gain a pound, as the federal government adopted a controversial method for determining who is considered overweight. And this controversial method was moving um, the BMI cutoff points from 27.8 and 27.3, respectively, um, to, well, it wasn't from, from that, from whatever they were using before. Um, and using NHANES data, um, the change in cutoffs increased. Well, NHANES is a national health and nutrition examination survey, and it's done every few years in the United States. You take a survey of, of the population, and you, you measure what's um, various values. Um, it moved men um, from 33% to 59%, and women from 36 to 50.7%. And um, 35.4 million more overweight. Now, what's the problem with using cutoffs like that? This is the problem. Um, BMI just takes into account body mass, but as we said in our definition, um, obesity is excess fat. And here we have a bodybuilder, and his BMI is 34.4, and over 30 is obese. Um, however, for the vast majority of people out there, uh, this is not going to confuse the picture. But in addition to having to be cautious about um, bodybuilders, I have here Europeans using the cutoff points here. And if you're Asian, Indian, Chinese, for example, um, you're going to have to have a lower value for overweight and a lower value for obesity. And I put deliberately here two question marks um, for the African population because there's some indication that it may take a, a greater degree of, of overweight to, to cause health problems in the African population. But the values have not changed. The values are the same. So what are the problems and health hazards? There is increased mortality from cardiovascular disease. And this is associated with increased BMI and increased waist circumference. So here we have it. I'm trying to get my pointer. Yes, here it is. If you have a BMI around um, 22 or 23, you're probably the lowest point. Um, and this is for women. And as your BMI goes up, the rate of death goes up. And the same, uh, this, is, this is, yes. And for men, um, the same thing. As BMI goes up, the rate of death goes up. Now, at the lower BMIs, it also goes up. But some of this may be due to the fact that some of the people in, in the lower weight categories who are dying have been cigarette smokers, people with cancer, and other conditions um, who've lost weight and come into that category. They're not necessarily healthy, um, well, persons without illnesses that have made them lose weight. So in, increased BMI is associated with increased mortality, but there's such a thing as normal weight central obesity, and this is also associated, associated with increased mortality. So you can look at the, this image, and I suppose you may be struck, if I can find my pointer again, um, yes, by the waist, and this is another image of a person whose BMI I'm not sure of, but I would suspect it's around 30, which is the cutoff point of, of obesity. And here's another image and, um, of another well-known person. And you will see the waist. You can look at the waist. But this BMI is going to be over, well over 30, I would imagine. But we all, I also showed you earlier um, the bodybuilder. 
and his waist circumference is 31.5 inches. So maybe some of the students here will have a waist circumference of 31.5 inches. I don't know. But waist circumference is not your pant size. Huh? Waist circumference is, if you can still feel the top of your hips here, um, is to take, take a tape measure around that point to the navel and to the back, and that's usually a little larger than your pant size or maybe considerably more. And here again, ethnicity matters. Person, persons of Asian uh, descent will have a lower cutoff point. But for the other population, rest of the other, uh, other ethnicities, it's 35 inches in women and 40 inches in men. And I deliberately put European hair because there's some, there's some thought that maybe women of African descent may be allowed a slightly larger waist circumference. And you can see two persons here having a conversation, and they're of quite different um, waist circumferences that shows up well on the screen. The metabolic profile also matters. You can be a little overweight, and if your blood pressure is just fine, your cholesterol profile is just fine, your blood sugar is just fine, then you may not have so much of a problem. Um, however, you may be more prone as years go by to get more overweight and develop some of these metabolic issues. Um, and with diabetes, you have to be particularly careful because you may not have a, a raised blood sugar when the physician measures it, but it starts with your body needing to produce a little bit more insulin to do the same work as, 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 as it used to do with less insulin before. And then as time goes on, you, you, you sort of produce as much insulin as you can, and the blood sugar starts to creep up slightly, slightly, slightly more until you get into the diabetic range. So quite often, that condition starts before we actually can identify it easily. And some of the other health hazards, as I mentioned before, as I just mentioned, will be diabetes, hypertension, um, lipid problems, gout, heart disease, stroke, and a lot of those come from the um, diabetes, hypertension, and, and, and lipid problems. Liver disease, you can get fatty liver disease and other liver disease. Venous thrombosis, you're more prone to have clots in your legs, and then those can shoot off and cause pulmonary emboli and sometimes death. Um, people are more prone to heartburn, they, 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 they reflux. Um, the, the weight wears out your joints, especially in your knees. Um, you're more prone to infections, skin infections. Sleep apnea. You snore very loudly at night as your airways close down. And eventually you, your breathing stops. And before you actually expire, your breathing comes back, on, comes back again. And that causes a lot of, of, of changes in, in the body and, and it's quite hazardous to your health. As well, you don't sleep, you don't get rested at night, and you tend to fall asleep during the day, and you could fall asleep at a wheel. Cancer is another um, issue that obesity can cause. But 40% of uterine cancer is attributed to obesity. It affects the hormones balance and the cycling of the hormones, and it can, it can produce um, these kind of problems. And it could also be a link to colon and breast cancer. Kidney disease, urinary incontinence, psychosocial function, um, it might affect self-esteem in some, in some persons, and it's a link, it's possible link to dementia. So it's, it's quite a long list. Now we get to the prevalence. In 2000, the Barbados Food uh, Consumption and Anthropometric Study found that 56% of men and 64% of women, 18 years and up, were either overweight or obese. So BMI 25 and above. That's obviously more than half the population. And just to give you a comparison, in 1999, uh, a study in Jamaica showed 32% of, of men, as opposed to our 56, and 54% of women were um, overweight or obese in Jamaica. 
Now, many of you may have heard of the Health of the Nation study. Um, this is a study that's been recently conducted by University of West Indies, Faculty of Medical Sciences and Chronic Disease Research Center. And here are some of the uh, figures. You have, in all age groups, um, for men, well, you have, a, in all age groups, you have a majority of, of persons, of men, overweight or obese. In the younger age group, 25 to 44, almost 50% of men, however, are normal weight. And when you look at, at um, an overall, 23% are, are obese and 58% overweight or obese combined. With women, 43% overall um, were obese. Uh, and even in the younger age group, over 4 to 5 percent obese, um, over 4 to percent obese in, in the 4 to 5 to 6 to 4, etc. And 74 percent, slightly cut off at the bottom there, are overweight or, or obese. Um, and that's the size of the problem we have in Barbados. It's, it's, it's significant. So if you took an, if you use a definition that took the average weight of a woman in Barbados, it would be somewhere in that overweight to obese category. Now, there's another study going on in Barbados. That's the Eastern Caribbean Health Outcomes Research Network. That's a project I'm associated, it's associated with, and so is Dr. Morris. Um, it's assembling a cohort of persons in Barbados, Trinidad, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Um, they're being asked um, general questions on, on health, health care utilization, sexual health, social and health behaviors, nutrition, etc. Um, persons get a, a brief examination, which includes, this, includes their weight and height, and a number of other things, including ECGs um, and blood pressures and a range of blood tests. Um, if you're approached by any of our nurses trying to recruit, recruit you into Ekhorn, please say yes. Um, so far, um, well, up to sometime in about October 2015, the study is still ongoing, there were 2,120 persons that participated, 40 years in age and up. I should say the health of the nation was 25, and this is now, this is 40. And the first study I showed you was 18 and up. So data is a little difficult to compare sometimes. But in Barbados, we've actually contributed 796 respondents up to that time, and we've pretty close to 1,000 now. We're getting right up to 1,000, um, and getting very close to our quota, ahead of the other islands. Um, like in most studies, you have a preponderance of, of females as opposed to males, and the mean age was 57. So just looking at Barbados' data, we get very similar figures um, to some of the other studies. Um, this, is, this is female, and this is, this is male. Um, and these are the normal weight ones. You see almost 4 to 5% of the men are normal weight. And but look here, almost 20% of the women are normal weight. Almost 20% of the women are normal weight. So you can do the maths, and the rest are either overweight or obese. Um, and just to show you, we've been studying this, this problem a lot. Um, in 2006, just prior to 2006, um, I did a study in the clinic I work at, Edgar Corcoran Clinic, and we recruited 630 persons. And remember, this is a clinic population. This is not a population-based population um, sample where you go out in the community. In Ekhorn, we're going to every fourth house in 35 enumeration, enumeration districts. I'm just asking people um, to participate in a study, come and get weighed and measured, et cetera. But these are people who have come to our clinic, so they may already have health problems. Um, in this, 65% of the, of the men um, were either overweight or obese, and 69% of the women. And you would expect higher prevalences of these issues if um, 
obesity was causing problems because these people will need to go to clinics. If you look at African American versus white American to get some compar comparison about ethnicity, um, you will see that obesity, and this is over 30, this is obesity, this is not overweight and obesity, is much more prevalent in African American women as, as opposed to white American women, whereas um, in men, it's, it's not very much different. So if we have so much obesity, then perhaps we should be assessing it. We should be quantifying it. We should be identifying it when patients come into our clinic. And in a, obesity is a very important parameter when um, managing persons who have diabetes. A survey was done in um, primary care clinics, polyclinics, and private practitioners, pri private practitioners' offices. And we found that in the polyclinics, 92% of persons got weighed at least once in two, a two-year period, whereas in private practice, 69% got weighed. But almost no one got their height measured. So they can't get a BMI. So you see, and even fewer had actually had the BMI calculated in the notes. And you only had to, to get your height measured once if you're an adult, once in, in, the, in the charts to count. And we didn't record anyone with a, with a waist circumference measurement. But waist circumference is particularly important um, in the overweight category, and maybe between 30 and 35 in the obese category, where it adds extra risk to the person. And it's also important in those normal weight persons who have all the fat distributed around the abdomen. So I call that the eyeball test. You look at the person, judge their height, maybe look at, it, look at their weight in the scale, and say, that person's obese, that person's overweight, where we go from there. And the question is, is the eyeball test enough? Just looking at someone. So I'll give you a little time to think. And this audience can put themselves where they want to put themselves. You don't have to tell me. But you think you're a little thin, thin, the right size, a little fat, overweight, or fat. So don't put up your hands as we go along. And then we can see this now. Are you happy with how your body looks based on your body mass? So if we... We start with the shorter persons first. If you're five foot, then you become overweight at 128 pounds and obese at 153. If you're five foot five, you become overweight at 150 and obese at 180. Taller persons, hold on, we're getting to you soon. Um, so if you identify yourself, now I put ideal BMI 20, but ideal, you know, is, is somewhere between 80, normal is somewhere between 80. 18 and a half to 25. Um, but I just use that, uh, and that probably is getting to the lower part of that mortality graph I showed you. So now the taller persons, um, five foot seven, overweight at 159 pounds, obese at 191. I'm not gonna, I didn't bring any tape measures here to measure waist circumference. Um, and six foot, um, any six, yes, you probably have some six footers, 184 for overweight and 221. So I don't know how that's stacked up with your pre, um, your perception. But if we had a, a, a more uh, mixed audience of, of uh, I think quite often it, um, perception doesn't quite match the medically calculated um, weight, weight status. When we ask persons at Wildey, who were normal weight, 24% a quarter said they were thin. This is the obesity study we did at Wilde, Edgar Cochrane Polyclinic. When we asked the overweight person, 60% said they were the right size or thin. Now, you have to ask these questions unless you, you don't get any answers. And if you're a physician asking a person to lose weight who doesn't think they're overweight, the first step is to have a conversation 
with them about perception. Because if I tell you to do something and you don't see a problem, you're not going to act. And with obese persons, 20% um, thought they were either the right size or thin, and 63% thought they were a little bit overweight or a little fat. With ECOR now, um, sorry, just got to get my pointer going. Um, if you look at normal weight people, um, a large number, 80% thought they were just about right. But with overweight people, um, about 20%, I think, I th about 20 I think there thought they were overweight. And um, with obese persons, about 20% thought they were uh, the right weight. And that's, that's for men. And for women, we have a similar picture where the um, yellowish line here is about the right weight. And you can see almost all the overweight women thought they were about, about the right weight. We asked a similar question in, at Wildy, and I probably won't go into details there, but it gives the same picture. So this gentleman is 460 pounds. He's six foot three inches. He has a BMI of 5 to 1. Uh, that's in the severe obesity range. He's a champion, or was a champion, sumo wrestler. He's not going to lose weight. He's trying to gain weight because they have sumo wrestlers larger than him, and he needs to jump on people and pin them. In the Wildy study, again, we asked people who were overweight how, many, how much weight they were, wanted to, lo to lose, and 45% overweight person says none. Um, and about 23% 20, of obese people said none to, 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 to five pounds. And we have a similar thing in the Eckhorn study. We've asked persons um, if they want to lose weight. Um, a few normal weight people want to lose weight. A few more um, overweight people want to lose weight, but the vast majority want to stay the same or have no intentions to do anything. Um, more obese people want to lose weight, but that's only up to about 60%, and these are from men. Um, so we have a large number of people out there who don't want to lose weight and don't see they have a problem and misclassify themselves. And I haven't looked at the women, but we'll press on. And will this study, um, we asked, do men prefer women a little fat? And 43% of the men said yes, and 60% of the women said yes. Um, but quarter the persons thought that being a little fat was a sign of good health. And quite often you see with patients, if they lose weight, they come back and say, their relatives are saying to them, you, you look ill. We've also done studies, um, John Paul Charles, um, one of my DM residents at the time, now a lecturer. Um, oh, sorry. Um, she studied 164 children, 11 to 19 years of age, 47% male, 53% female, 82 normal weight, 21 overweight, and 6 to 1 obese. And 33% of the overweight obese children consider themselves normal weight, and 32% of the mothers of overweight children consider their child to be normal weight. So here again, there's no problem identified, so there's, there's no problem to solve. And if you don't weigh your patients, check their BMI, do the waist circumference, then you can't start in a discussion. So, so we come to the final sort of segment of this talk, which is personalized care. And I've called it personalized care because the treatment of obesity obviously is a bigger problem than one-to-one -one contact with the patient. It has social causes, economic causes. Um, it, it's a built environment, whether we have pavements people can walk on or lit areas. Um, it's architectural, whether we put a parking lot right next to the building or elevator right next to the entrance so we get people to walk more. There are all those issues. It, 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 it um, depends on how many health threats we have, how many chefettes and 
Burger Kings and KFCs, etc., near to us, more convenient, so we can stack up with calories. But with person I care, we're talking about one-to-one -one contact with persons and trying to give them very specific care for their, their circumstances. And everyone needs to consider diet, and we know this already, physical activity, something called lifestyle modification, and there's the psychological aspects of it. Some people may warrant pharmacotherapy, and some people could benefit from surgery. Now, the best weight loss program assesses and treats obesity-related conditions, provides individualized nutritional exercise and behavioral counseling, diets generally not less than 900 calories per day. They don't have to go that low. Cost is not prohibitive. And there's no obligation to buy products, supplements, vitamins, or injections. Once you have to buy those sorts of things, beware. And doesn't make claims that cannot be backed up. But this is one claim I can make for the cause of, the cause of obesity is energy intake greater than energy expenditure. And the treatment of obesity, energy expenditure has to be greater than energy intake. So some more facts. If you take a, a calorie a, in 2,500 calories a day, that's close to a million calories in a year. So you see those labels, a 2,500 calorie diet for a man. Um, so that's close to a million calories a day. You've got to balance that exactly at the end of the year to maintain your weight. How does the body do that without an accountant? If you had that amount of money, you had to spend a million dollars and take in a million dollars and balance it you, need, you would probably need an accountant. Walking one mile, it depends how heavy you are, could, could burn 100 calories, give or take some. One pound of body fat, you, you burn that body fat, you get 3,500 calories. Do the maths. One needs to walk 35 miles to burn one pound of fat. Now imagine if you're 30 to 40 pounds overweight. Okay. And many obese persons are sedentary, un unfit, and can't walk this distance. So the next thing you do is look at what successful people have done. In the United States, there's a National Weight Loss Registry. To get into that registry, you've had to, loss, to lose 30 pounds and kept this 30 pounds off for at least one year. So these are successful people. They've lost weight and been able to maintain the weight loss. 45% of registry participants lost the weight on their own. They didn't need to have any special program. And the other 55% lost with dietitians, physicians, weight loss programs, etc. cetera. Um, the typical diet was low fat, low calorie. 78% ate breakfast every day. Remember, when you eat breakfast, you eat more calories, so it has to to be with eating less calories throughout the rest of the day. Um, very importantly, 75% weigh themselves at least once a week, um, and about 4 to 4% weigh themselves at least once a day. Why is that important? That's important because they're monitoring their weight, they're probably monitoring their diet with a food diary, they're monitoring the exercise patterns, and they're keeping track accurately of what they're doing, and they could take corrective action. And that's shown to be very important. 90% exercise on average about one hour per day. I pause there. Imagine exercising one hour per day. Does anyone in this room, the cameras aren't on you, exercises one hour per day? Oh God, you have to be retired. But I, I won't mention any names, but that's very, that's very um, unusual. I'm trying to find out how I can exercise one hour, one hour per day and still be Dean. Um, where, where's this time going to come from? But, but you have to look at the issues and say, but these are what successful persons who have lost weight and kept it off have done. But I should stress at this point, you, can't, you don't expect to lose weight without going on a diet. 99% of persons who, in this registry, diet was the main thing. 
exercise becomes extremely important to maintain the weight off. And going with exercise, of course, you won't have no time to watch TV. So it goes with that. You know, if I was to exercise one hour per day, my TV time is gone. Beware. You lose weight successfully, what happens? Your metabolism readjusts so you don't starve to death. It's thinking you're disappearing, just like your relatives. And your energy expenditure decreases in the body. Um, your hormones secreted by the gut, or not secreted by the gut in some cases, um, lead to an increased appetite and other changes that promote energy in storage. So after three to six months, you're in the same diet, you're no longer losing weight. You get despondent, what's gone wrong? You give up, weight comes back on. But these changes last for a year. And in the National Weight Loss Registry, they've shown that people who have kept the weight off two to five years are, are much more likely to keep it off. So it's, it's gonna be a struggle for the first year or two. With hypertension, it's all much simpler with salt after about a, a month your taste buds readjust. Some other things to consider. Between basal metabolic rate, thermic response to food, and physical activity, where do you think you, you um, burn most of your, your calories in a day? Now, basic, basal metabolic rate is a bit like sitting down in the audience here, lying down in bed, doing nothing. Just breathe in, your heart is beating, a few brain waves go in, um, but you're not doing any other movement. So call that A, thermic response to food, to, to digest food, absorb it, and to put it in storage, you have to use some energy. And then, so if you eat a lot of food, you, you, you have to, you get a higher thermic response, but you have more calories. Um, protein has a higher res thermic response than carbohydrate, and carbohydrate has a, a greater thermic response than fats. So you can store all your fat you eat quite easily. Um, so which, where do you think, is it A, um, based on metabolic rate, B, thermic response, or C, physical activity, you burn most of your energy? So hands for A, okay. Hands for B, hands for C, okay. All right, uh, now I wanna come to some slides later on and we'll answer that question. Um, I just put a, a warning against watching TV. It's probably have no impact on everyone, anyone, you know, the increased um, mort mortality um, associated with watching, um, increase in obesity and s with watching TV associated with 23% increase in obesity and a 14% increase in diabetes um, extra every two hours watching TV a day. Um, I, I promise to come back to that, to that, answer that question. Genetic factors, yes, there are genetic factors. They can affect basic metabolic rate. They, could respect, they can affect thermic response to food. They could affect spontaneous physical activity. Um, and they have specific genes associated with leptin, which affects appetite. Now you get the answer here. Basic metabolic rate. This 20-year-old woman, remember lots of those things say, you, uh, food labels say for the 2,200 calorie diet, the 2,500 calorie diet. So that's what an ex average person should be using. Then um, her basic metabolic rate would be 1,954 calories. The rest would be in thermic response to food or physical activity. Now, of course, if you're a marathon runner, you're an exception to the rule. But um, if you exercise and you count calories and exercise a mile, two miles, 200 calories, not 100 calories throughout the day, walking about 300 calories. It doesn't match up to this. But why is basic metabolic rate important? That's why you gain weight when you get older. That's why I'm gaining weight. Um, and I, I am gaining weight, but you know, I mean, it's is noticeable. Because this, this same woman, if we can, you have to substitute another photograph because we didn't have this lady at 20 years old. When she becomes 60 years of of age, her basal metabolic rate would be 8% less. So she'd be burning just 17, 6 or 6 calories sitting about the place. It's 8% it's less calories just to keep her going. Um, and that means you have to eat less food. And I always say to myself, 
I'm a firm believer in equal pay for equal work. But when I go to restaurants, I really think women shouldn't really get equal size plates. Um, because men have a 15% higher base of metabolic rate than women. And if you get equal plates, I, I think you should just, women should just stick up for the equal pay. And those who are muscular, um, the muscle burns more calories than fat burns. So it's not all equal. Just to keep muscle going, more calories are used up. Okay, now energy intake. So we, energy expenditure, energy intake. You obviously you get increased calorie intake with availability of cheap palatable energy dense foods. Um, small frequent meals and eating breakfast may be associated with decreased risk of obesity, maybe. Um, and then you have to have conscious and unconscious calorie restriction. So look at this bottle. Don't get thirsty. Look at this one. Which one is better for you? Coke or Minute Maid? Yeah, you're catching on. Um, as far as calories are concerned, probably the Coke. You get some vitamin C in the Minute Maid, right? and they've taken all the fiber out by squeezing it out. Now, I, photo I, I photographed this from the newspaper. Now, I have nothing against any fast food, fast food joint. They serve a useful purpose. I visit them um, in moderation. But this is an ad I took out of the, of the papers. And um, I can't really see it as clearly in, in this particular slide, but I think it's the Whopper, Whopper double Whopper. Um, but the, the single um, Whopper, not both of them in a special deal for whatever it is there, uh, is 1,430 calories. But if you were a little knowledgeable and a little cautious, the sandwich alone is 600 calories. That's not too bad. You know, it's good bread, good, good meat, lettuce, and so on, sa um, tomato. You add the cheese and the mayonnaise, you're going up to 760. You add the fries, most fries like 400 calories. You add the Coke, 260 calories, you get up to 1430. And it's a, it's a deal, it's a, it's a value meal. Okay. Now, before prescribing a diet, therefore, one must assess an individual's readiness to change. Now this is an individual obviously wants to stay slim, okay? Um, we have no problem with her, she's not obese. She's not the problem. The sumo wrestler, he would be your problem. Although with exercise, um, it, it counteracts some of the problems of obesity. So if a person doesn't see the reason for changing, it's no importance, then you get a value conflict. A value conflict will develop between the practitioner and, and, and the patient. And persons may not feel they can diet. They've dieted several times before and they've never been successful. They've bought gym equipment and gym clothes and they're just in the wardrobe and, or hanging up clo um, clothes are being hang, hung on the gym equipment. And they may lack, lack confidence. And this is something practitioners should do rather than patients, but you can do it as well. You can, look, you can look at the pros and cons. You don't change because there's always some benefit of not changing. Okay, there's, there's always some benefit from not changing. You, to break inertia, it makes you uncomfortable. You don't have to think about what you eat. You can eat the food you really like. Um, if, you, if you change, you have to think about what you eat, et cetera, and you might worry about expense. So when persons are it's the same guy still, still in conversation, but now they're, they're talking about, well, pros and cons of eating lunch. But when a person is forced to think about the pros and cons, then it, it, helps, it helps change your mind a bit. It gives you some, uh, it, gives you, it gives you pause for thought, and um, you, you get some doubt about your opinions. Now, there are always persons who want to go 
on the full diet, zero calorie diet, you know, and they're going to do everything. But sometimes people are overwhelmed by very large goals, and you need to have small achievable goals. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to say, I'm waiting until I go on the special diet next year. We're in February, right? Um, and I can't start anything until I go on a special diet. You could start small. So if you're just going to say, I'm going to eat less or exercise more, that's not very specific. All right? But you could say to yourself, I'm going to walk five miles every day. And that's very specific. But you might not be able to walk five miles every day unless you're the one member of the audience who does it. Um, walk 30 minutes a day. You could probably do that for most people. But what happens if you have to work late one day, like I frequently have to do? So walking 30 minutes, four days per week, is specific, attainable, and forgiven. And perhaps you need to modify your goals. Because one of the greatest stumbling blocks to, to losing weight is you have unrealistic expectations of what you could do and what you can achieve. And you're not going to lose much weight by this walk-in unless you diet. And the same thing, you could, you could reduce fat from 40% to 35% and then to 30%. And that gives you um, way stations where you can have success and you can see you're making progress. You could also, instead of saying, I want to lose weight, you could say, I want to eat less fatty food. I'm going to cut out those French fries from the fast food restaurants, which have 400 calories. And I'm going to use a baked potato at 160 calories. It'll get, get up to 400 calories if you put on the works. When I go to American restaurants, they offer me the works. The works gets it up to 400 calories, you know, on your baked potato. It's, it's, it's just as bad as French fries. You could start eating a new food, baked potatoes instead of the French fries, fruit instead of cake, water instead of juice. You need to be empowered, and whoever is guiding you or if you're guiding yourself to develop skills and self-sufficiency, to build confidence. And we notice from the National Weight, um, weight Registry in the United States, self-monitoring is very important. If you ask an overweight or obese person to estimate the calories they consume, studies show they, they underestimate by 30%. If you ask a normal weight person to estimate the calories, studies show somewhere 10 to as, as much as 30%, they will underestimate. When you have self-estimation, you have to add these figures on to the average person. Um, and Observing and recording makes you think about what you're doing. And you could also record all your activities, eating, exercising, um, ex um, your weight as an outcome. Now, stimulus control is important. There's no point wanting to lose weight and buying the Coke and the Minute Maid or the Pine Hill Dairy um, and stocking it up in the most visible area on, in your kitchen. Um, you can choose one of our best restaurants here. We've been recorded, so I won't try to call any more names. And you, you have a large buffet. What's your strategy if you go to this buffet? Should you go to the buffet? And if you go to the buffet, you have to pre-plan what you're going to do in that buffet. Um, I bring lunch to work for two reasons. One, I don't have any other time, much time to go to buy lunch. But if I bought lunch, I know for sure I'm going to eat far more calories. And some things become ingrained. You, your custom on a Friday, going home, um, drinking a half bottle of wine, whatever it is, uh, all has calories. Um, and then maybe munching on French fries or whatever else to go with it. And that becomes ingrained. Friday night is associated with these things, and you buy, go to the supermarket, you buy these things, etc. And you have to know those things, think about it, and have some cognitive restructuring. In the, health, in, the, in the registry, they also show that people who keep the weight off the best 
don't change their, their routine at weekends, eating routines. They eat it almost the same way on weekends as during the week. Lots of persons with diet during the week and then go all out, all, all out in the calorie intake on weekends. Slow down the eating process. Chew more slowly. When you're very hungry, you eat very quickly. So we must have all experienced this if we thought about it. We've eaten very quickly, then we feel over full. Think about how you felt before eating, while eating, and after eating. And think of what you're going to do next time. Multiple small meals might be a way to go. Uh, physical activity, cognitive restructuring. Don't blame yourself. Think of what you're going to do next time. You've overeaten, I'll exercise a bit more. Next time I'll take, do something different. Social support is very important because we eat um, together and that can have quite an influence. You need to consider any obstacles to what you're doing and, and, try, and, and try to overcome those. Why you over at what, what you can do next time um, so you, you won't do the same thing. And of course, you keep track of measurable, comfortable things. We went through that already. Now, the type of diet. Now, I'm not a dietitian. Um, I'm a family physician. But adherence is more important than, than the type of diet. Adherence is what goes wrong. You could lose weight on any diet that is calorie restricted. So the diet we physicians like are the balanced low calorie diet, vegetables, um, fruits, etc. They could include portion control diets, but portion control diets are actually diets you can buy pre-packaged pre to have the exact number of calories. You could, you know, if you're fed the exact number of calories in a pre-packaged thing, that's all the calories you have access to, then your calorie intake will be controlled. You could have low fat diets, you could have very low fat diets, low carbohydrate diets, very low carbohydrate diets. You could have the Mediterranean diet, those are what people in Greece used to eat years ago. Now they're probably eating the, all eating the American diet. Um, the DASH diet, you'll probably hear more of that in the next public lecture. And fat diets, okay, you, you lose weight on all of these. Fat diets, you eat this food now, and you eat another food. Um, you don't eat a certain thing close to bedtime. You know. It, 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 the problem with those diets, even though they're very popular and people rush onto them, they don't stick to them. So the DASH diet is fruits, vegetables, nuts, low-fat dairy, lean meats, fish, poultry, whole grains. Um, vegetables of, of various colors, fruits of various colors. You can't go wrong with that. Um, and you can, you can eat a combination of different types of vegetables, including starchy, starchy ones as well and you don't add much salt. The Mediterranean diet is, is very similar, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. Um, they don't eat much uh, meat, maybe a couple times a, a month. They eat fish and poultry at least twice a week. It's not too, too heavy on meat. Um, red wine, right? And, and, and in our modern health, it should always put optional, but those people in, in, the, in Greece, they probably wasn't optional, they probably just drank wine all the time. But alcohol has um, calories. An olive oil. An oil, it's pure fat, but those liquid fat, those oils, by and large, unless they're coconut and some palm oils, are much better for you um, than the saturated oils in, in, in the more solid ones. Um, but they, they are high in calories. And they usually grew, grew their own um, fruits and, and vegetables, so they got exercise as well. And eating was a social event um, rather than just something rushed, or we did. So a typical plate could look like this. Half of it is fruit and vegetables. Um, a bit more vegetables than fruit, probably. Um, you got a quarter of, of grains. At least half your grains are whole grains. You have some um, variety of protein and low-fat dairy. Um, so you eat a variety of things, and you, you get variety. You, you don't have to eat the same thing every day. Now, pitfalls. Expectations often exceed what is feasible. And when expectations exceed what is feasible, then you have problems. 
People often predict that they will change more easily than is possible. They often overestimate their abilities and are unaware that they are inaccurate. Uh, have you ever overestimated your ability, felt you reach a deadline, and you haven't, two weeks later, you haven't been able to achieve what you set yourself two weeks ago? People often assume that making the change will improve their lives more than they can, can reasonably be expected. So this is a classic example of the false, false hope syndrome. And people make these errors month after month, year after year, they keep making it. They go through a whole career making these errors. One of the most famous examples of the planning fallacy is that of the Oxford English Dictionary. But the Oxford English Dictionary was a great success, at least in my time, when we, before we had computers and we needed to get the dictionary. In 1860, the plans were in place to complete it within three years. In 1879, there was a new deal to publish it within a decade. But after five years, they had only got so far as the word ant. It was finally completed in 1928, by which time it was considered out of date and revisions began at once. But the false hope syndrome is, applies to diet. Now I'm coming to the end, and I have a slide in drugs, and I have two slides in surgery. Um, if your BMI is, say, over 35 or 30 and you have some comorbid conditions like diabetes, heart problems, etc., you may want to consider some things to help you lose weight. One drug available here in Barbados is the top one, Orlistat. That, that is, stays in the gut, almost none, is, none of it is absorbed, and it cuts down your absorption of fat. So you eat fat, and you pass it out the other way, and um, a good percentage of it, and that's how it works. You have the other drugs which are not available here. This second one can be used um, uh, for, to reduce appetite. You can use it on long terms, on a long term basis. But phentermine is not available in Barbados, as far as I know, and the other drugs in that group, um, and they work to make you feel full quicker. They're related to a drug that was taken off the market some years ago because it caused heart problems. Um, these are what we call sympathomimetic drugs, and the lorcaserin is a serotonin uptake blocker. It's similar to some things you have in certain types of antidepressants. And drugs that I added here are available, and they, they're used for other things. Like bupropion is used for um, smoking sensation. It could be used in depression. Topiramid is used to treat migraine. It can treat epilepsy. Metformin has a very small effect on, on weight, but is used to treat diabetes or people um, who have certain other uh, metabolic problems. And the last one here um, is injectable. And um, as far as I know, it's not available here. And just a word of warning, HCG, HCG injections, beta HCG injections are useless and should not be used for weight loss. There's no study that showed that these injections make you lose weight any more than you would if you got a placebo injection. And they're often um, combined with a very low calorie diet, which generally speaking, is not um, recommended. Because they, could, they will cause short-term weight loss, but not um, sustainable. Bariatric surgery. Bariatric, bariatric surgery is very effective. Um, you could um, bypass the stomach. There's a stomach here. You could put bands around the stomach, so it can't expand much. Um, and you get fuller quicker, or with that bypass one I showed you, you, you don't absorb the food as well, as well as you get fuller quicker. And you're gonna lose lots of weight. You could, use, you could lose 30% of your, of your body weight. Now, 5% of your body weight loss is considered a good weight loss. 
it may not be what a person is hoping to lose, and that's where expectations go wrong, and you, then you fail. But 5%, if you're 100 pounds, that's 5 pounds, 200 pounds, that's 10 pounds. So 200 pounds to 10 pounds. 10% is considered pretty good, but 30% is what we're doing in the diabetes reversal study in Barbados. Um, that's been done by the Chronic Disease Research Center, and persons are getting a very low calorie diet and losing 30 pounds. Well, that's not necessarily 30%, 30% but they're losing 30 pounds, um, and they're, they're, showing, they're beginning to show that diabetes is being reversed. So 62% will have the hypertension reversed, 70% will have the cholesterol treated, um, diabetes will resolve in 77% of cases, and sleep apnea, that breathing problem, will resolve in 86% of cases. Um, there's some 10%, 20% of your weight is regained in, in a few years' time. You still have to have a diet. It's not just fully magic, but it does work well. This, uh, it's very expensive, and most people won't want it, and we wouldn't have enough surgeons and enough cash, although if you can afford it in the long term, it might be good for you, especially if you have a lot of, of other conditions associated with, associated with obesity. So, in summary, we should assess body mass. You should assess your own body mass. Just don't rely on the, on the eyeball test. Do your BMI. Look at those cutoff points. Do your waist circumference. Um, remember that obesity is a huge problem. Only 26% of women, to put it a different way, in Barbados are normal weight um, in that 25 and up category. Um, we shouldn't estimate perception what we think about things. And so we have to look at some of the facts. And I often tell my patients, it's, it's, yes, you consider you're overweight by my calculations, you're normal weight by yours. But I expect that because the average person in Barbados is overweight or obese. So you look average and you would normally think you're okay. We have to think of personalized care, which is adherence. It's more important than the actual diet, but we, we recommend a nice balanced diet. Manageable goals, realistic expectations, problem solving, decrease, decrease calories. You can easily decrease calories in those drinks. Um, stimulus control, self-monitoring, your eating style, your, um, how fast you eat, etc. cetera. Uh, whether you concentrate on eating or eat while watching TV and not, not know what you're doing. Um, increase exercise and, you, and uh, you should always have your associated conditions like cholesterol, diabetes, etc., assessed and um, treated. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Adams. And uh, it's a lot of food for thought, and it certainly probably will change my lifestyle this evening because, because I was here so late listening to your lecture, I can prepare a healthy meal. So I'm going to have to go to and visit a fast food restaurant. But I'm going to eat slowly and probably place multiple orders. I'm going to ask for some social support. Multiple orders. <laughs> and uh, maybe some cognitive re restructuring as well. I think about what I'm eating. Uh, the, the floor is open to questions. Uh, but I've, of course, as chair, I get the privilege, pr privilege of asking the first question. And I'm just going to throw this one out here because I know that several of you are thinking the same thing. Is there such a thing as being fat and fit? There is such a thing as being fat and there's such a thing as being fit. And if you're, you're fit enough and fat enough and you're fit and fat at the same time, you have enough um, exercise, you can exercise, your weight is not preventing you from exercising, and you can actually get into exercise. Um, you have enough cardiovascular capacity, et cetera, to do the exercise. Yes, you can be reasonably um, um, healthy, and you could have those metabolic parameters um, reasonably um, under control. But you're not, I can't, you, ha you have to say, the population as a whole, you'll be slightly less healthy than, than a, a slim, fit person who exercises a lot. But you, 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 if you don't lose weight and you exercise, you're 
definitely healthier, and, and in some cases, you don't ha develop many problems um, while exercising at all. But when you stop, then issues cr kick in. So yeah. you, don't, you don't support that. Is this my con? So the sumo wrestler may not have developed diabetes at that point until he retired, but it was forced to go into uh, um, a, uh, uh, the professional, that, what's that other professional league, Euclid? Um, no, they, um, yeah, whatever, the, re the, the, the retirees league or whatever, yes. Retired, yeah. yeah. So he's a retired sumo wrestler. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the audience? So we have a question from Dr. George, lecturer in internal medicine, but it's going to be very public based. It actually is. Uh, the question relates to the perceptions um, that you were talking about. Were you able to, in your population, determine any ethnic differences in the perceptions of overweight? Well, there Three studies there that looked at perceptions. One, two were in Bar all three data were reported only from Barbados. So we don't have that widespread to give us that answer. But in the ECHORN study, we're going to have data from Trinidad. So we have an Asian African population in Trinidad. We're going to have data from USVI, and we're going to have data from Puerto Rico Hispanics. So when you put all that together, you will s we will see if there is a um, be able to answer that question. Uh, the next question I have, which is... But, but before you go on, um, as far as perception is concerned, in, in studies in the United States, um, African-American women um, are much more accepting of overweight than white American women. Yeah. And following into the next question, it's the whole issue of ethnicity again. Uh, because you don't actually have... Um, cutoffs for the African-American population. So sometimes when I see those figures in predominantly, populations of predominantly African origin, I wonder if they may actually be an overestimate because they're still using the Europoid um, cutoffs in defining both overweight and obesity. So obesity um, is a, a specialty in um, change in it, it's in development and cutoff points have changed for general populations over the years. And um, some persons are suggesting a BMI of 38 persons of African ethnicity in women as a cutoff point. But we can't quote those because those are just suggestions at this point. And yes, we, um, if you remember one of the figures I showed you of the women, um, the BMI was 30 and the waist was relatively narrow, that person is probably at very little risk of anything, even though her BMI would be high. Thank you, Peter. Before I ask you my question, let me just say that it's quite possible as Dean to exercise for an hour a day, because Deans are only allowed to sleep for about six hours, and that leaves 18 hours. Our normal work day is 12 to 14 hours, so you've still got about four hours that you can easily exercise for one hour a day. And of course, I recommend swimming. But of all the many diets in your very thorough presentation you mentioned, you didn't mention the nine-inch diet. Nine-inch diet. Let's hear about this one, Professor. The nine-inch diet refi refers to the size of the plate. And before the Second World War, dinner plate sizes were nine inches in diameter. After the Second World War, in that period of enormous rationing across the world and financial difficulties and food difficulties and not being able to eat meat, especially in places like Britain, people started making plates larger. And so if you go home and you check on your plate size, they're usually now 11 inches or even 12 inches. And restaurants tend to serve very large plates because it's a more dramatic presentation, even though Cuisine Monsieur often provides a very small portion of a very elegant presentation. But the plates are much bigger. So when you go to a buffet anywhere in Barbados, like Brown Sugar Restaurant or any of the other places that serve buffets, then there's a 2,000 calorie meal on a 12 inch plate. And and it's usually the larger people who fill the plate like a mountain. But coming to my question, I want to ask you for what's happening, if you can update us, on the obesity problem in children. I did a heritage tour in Bridgetown with a group of Texas archi architects walking through town. And we were doing that just after school was out. 
And the visitors remarked to me on the size of the school children. And usually it has been much fatter girls because mm -hmm. the girls stop exercising earlier in life in school than the guys. And when I did my first study with Pamela Gaskin, and I used to eyeball, and I would, I would get an absolutely accurate figure of 10% of guys and 20% of girls who were obese in the classroom. And that's just how it turned out. But today in Bridgetown, there were an awful lot of fat boys and fat girls. Now, the hypothesis might be that fat boys and fat girls walk through Bridgetown, you know. <laughs> When I came home to Barbados and I saw all these fat ladies in the, hypertension, in the medical outpatient clinic, the hypothesis was that they l maybe like to sit around and chat in the clinic and talk to their friends. But maybe they're there because of the disease. And that's exactly how it turns out. Obesity is disease related. My question to you, therefore, my two questions are, what about the children? What are you seeing in your practice? And does the current study look at the children? Is there any new data on it? because they seem to be getting fatter and fatter. And secondly, what about the public health approaches? You've taken the personalized care, but it's obvious that in many entities, taxation is required to change population behavior. And taxation works. It works in alcohol, it works in air, air tickets, it works in all sorts of ways. We know that Bloomberg was unsuccessful in New York with taxing the oversized drinks, but what are your thoughts about the children and about the public health measures? Okay, um, the studies I quoted there um, on prevalence were only for adults. So the health of the nation is 25 and up, and ECHORN is 40 years and up. Um, the one study in children was just on a perception basis, showing that 30% of overweight children consider the weight normal, and the mothers also consider their, their weight normal. Um, but obesity is obviously getting um, a bigger problem uh, in children, and they're feeding into the adults who start at a very young age being overweight and obese, especially um, in women. Um, the next question was the public health approach in specific, um, what, what was the question, the public health approach? Taxation. Taxation and regulation of what? Well, taxation and regulation is one way to encourage people to do certain things. The level of taxation you'll have to, to, to put on to be effective is unknown, so it's, it's open to, to studies. Um, they have tried taxation of small amounts in the United States, etc. cetera. Um, but, the public, but obviously obesity is a public health problem. And education, public education, um, safe places to exercise, the built environment are very important. And it's not gonna be solved with just personalized care, but the talk was largely on, on, personali on personalized care. Um, I, I don't know, well, I, uh, what you feel about taxation, but it, you'll have to very, there, there's so many different th things you could, you could t possibly tax, and even if you, you had a healthy food, you could still overeat certain healthy things, although it's, it's a bit more of a challenge. Uh, so plans are, are afoot to study the effects of the taxation in Barbados, so maybe at the next talk we'll be able to give you the answer to that yeah. question. Okay, so we have two more questions, one from uh, Dr. Natasha sobers Granham, lecturer in public health. Hi, good evening. Uh, Dean Adams, thank you for that very intriguing talk. Um, I was particularly um, taken by the data on gender and the gender variations, those really fascinated me. And so I wanted to ask about the fact that there was a higher proportion of obese women wanting to lose weight so, um, than the men. And I wondered if that was statistically significant. I just presented the proportions so far. And the second thing was that among the overweight men, more of them were comfortable with their weight. Um, also in the data that you presented. So something that was just, or a certain trend started to you know, come up in my mind. One, we are saying a higher proportion of the women want to lose weight. They're the ones who are the more obese. Men are more comfortable with their weight. So yes, they're the ones that are more obese, but they're not comfortable with their obesity. And they're not, and, but yet they're not um, reducing that. So are, are we not putting out the right messages to them? Are we not creating the right environment for the women? And I matched that against the image that you put up of a <clears throat> 
underweight anorexic lady uh, with a BMI of 17. So I wonder also about the pressure uh, on women that's not working. Okay. Um, the anorexic underweight woman is actually a supermodel who is probably getting paid more than we are getting paid. A lot to look, more. To look like that. Um, I suppose those are the days when supermodels had to be, be very thin. As far as um, the statistical analysis here for the ECHORN data, we don't, I don't have that yet. We just, I just ran these figures to, to show some data at the presentation and to show how it's, how it's um, be, being consistent. Um, but women um, wanting to lose weight um, could be because uh, it could be, I mean, we haven't got the mean BMIs of those women because they're all obese. You know, there's a lot more overweight men. And um, I, it's, a great, it's a gradual thing. It's not that people don't see obesity as a bad thing. They just see that their, their, their cutoff points aren't our cutoff points. So their cutoff points for normal weight is somewhere like a BMI of 29 or 30, close to the obese range. And then they want to lose a little bit of weight, and as they get more and more obese, then they definitely want to lose weight. So the cutoff points are, are, um, are, different, are, are just different from ours. Um, and I think that's one of the main issues. People do want to lose weight, but they make a false assessment. Well, and they do that, I think, because there's so many more overweight person. I don't think that quite answers your question. And was there another question at the end? That's fine. Okay. Okay. So penultimate question. Good evening. I'm Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl Kadag McLean from the Faculty of Social Sciences. I'm a psychology lecturer. Uh, the individual factors, yes, are very relevant and personalized care in terms of the health coaching, yes. My concern would be the environmental factor of work um, in our tropical environment, which encourages sedentary work behavior um, to the extent that that would also influence you know, the obesity levels. Um, to what extent do you think those environmental factors like sedentary work behavior would need to be st measured in these studies and also to what extent would it then contribute to prevention if the workplace gets involved in helping people reduce their weight? Well, sedentary, I've developed a very sedentary type of lifestyle since I've become dean. Um, and, you know, we have phones now that do everything for us. So on this phone, it could tell me how many steps I made in a day. I just keep it in my pocket. And I can see when I'm hard at work at one of those six-hour meetings I have to attend every so frequently, um, how the step count goes down. And even if I go and do 5Ks um, around the built environment where I live, which is actually quite good, I can't get my step count over 10,000, OK? Um, so I think that's very important because it's a balance. Now, even if you exercise a fair amount and you don't diet, you're still going to gain weight. But the work environment is also something that will um, imp impact on your diet. Um, for example, I, I had a patient on a construction site, and he says all the foreman brought were soft drinks. And I said, you have to go back and discuss with him making water available or bringing water yourself. Um, one minibus driver drank 10 Cokes a day. I did the maths for him and showed him how many calories it was. And many persons I in um, offices, they have snack machines with lots of calories in the snacks. And people would come around with lunches that may have l lots of calories. And with these phones, you could do a lot of things. You could just say, um, fast food restaurant, um, hamburger, and the calories will come up, at least for the international ones. Okay, um, So I think those things are all important. And, and it's actually it's a problem. Because 50 years ago, didn't have motor cars like we have now. and didn't have computers, and lots of the, of the work was 
much more the work was physical than, than it is now. So final question, and Professor Roach, Professor of Respiratory Medicine. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for a very intriguing lecture. Um, and I'm very glad that you mentioned of, uh, sleep apnea because, as you well know, it is the commonest uh, hazard of obesity since 83% of patients with a BMI above 35 have obstructive sleep apnea. And it also is very important because unless you treat the sleep apnea, you have no chance of your diet being successful at all. So, you know, you have to treat that first before you can get your, your diet effective. But I wanted to change tack a little bit and, a, and ask a very, and ask a very perhaps a, a too general a question. But as this is the Dean's lecture, what do you see as the role of the university in tackling this problem? Very good question for the Dean. That's a very good question for the Dean. <laughs> as a, um, well, the university um, has been studying the problem, and there are lots more studies going on at present. Um, Health of the Nation, Eckhorn, for example, the Diabetes Reversal Study. And the role of the university is also in education of practitioners, um, for example, primary care practitioners in personalized approaches, which is the behavior change approaches, so they can more effectively interact with the patients. Just simple things about finding out the patient's perceptions, where they are in the stages of change. Um, the, so we can have a better educated um, medical, medical professional through our CME activities. It could also be partially public education and, and public health approaches. The, the, the university works very closely with the, with the ministry Ministry of Health. So I think overall the university has played and is playing and will play uh, a very significant role um, in, in healthcare in Barbados and both on a personalized basis and, uh, and an overall public health approach. Thank you, Dean. And I have a very quick comment from Sir Henry who is now missing a mic, but I'll walk okay, towards you. Okay. This is a lot of exercise, so I can supersize my meal. Okay. <laughs> the university's major attempt to deal with these chronic diseases was initiated with the establishment of the Chronic Disease Research Center. And tonight, when we came in, I challenged Dr. Sobers to move into the next phase with Dr. Alafia Samuels in terms of the behavior change that we need to initiate. We have produced an enormous body of data about the chronic diseases, but we have not yet challenged the role of behavioral change. And you guys here, the under 30s, it's your responsibility, along with the social science department, which I've tried for years to engage in studies and practice of behavior change so that behavior change can be meaningful in Barbados. Because basically, people who are overweight, unhealthy, they simply laugh. And many of the older people say, God made me this way. My mother had diabetes. There's nothing that can change that. And we have to approach the issue of behavior change. It's a major public health role and the university must lead the way in partnership between medicine, social sciences, and with the Ministry of Health, which is at last woken up to the issue of research. Because when I came home 30-something years ago, there was no research going on. And um, behavior change is obviously very important, both on a personal level and overall population level. Um, but lots of the changes are incremental. Lots of changes in, in, in practices and behaviors are incremental. And you may not see major things, but over the years, they, they do add up. Um, another thing we're, we're doing um, with one of our projects is trying to re-engineer some of the, the diabetes care and primary care. That's a collaboration through Eckhorn, Yale, Ministry of Health. Um, and, and, and those are little things that won't solve the problem by themselves, but the, the sum total will get us, get us there. Sure. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dean, for a very outstanding presentation. And audience, for your, for your very thoughtful questions and also allowing me to get some steps in this evening. So the program now comes to an end, and I'm going to invite Dr. Joseph Herbert, who is part-time lecturer in family medicine here 
uh, new part-time lecturer in family medicine, the faculty. You can applaud for that. Uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Hi, good night, everybody. Um, I'll be brief so you can get home, get to sleep, and wake up early tomorrow morning for a jog, yeah. <laughs> That's my intention, I hope. Uh, anyway, on behalf of the medical faculty, I'd like to thank, of course, you, the audience, for, for coming out tonight. Um, I think it's this sort of interaction that creates a lot more meaning and purpose to these sort of uh, events, and thank you for your interesting questions. Um, certainly, I'd like to thank those who made tonight possible, um, particularly um, Ms. Christiane Walcott from the Dean's Office, um, Educational Media Services, they're out here filming, working very hard. Thank you guys. Um, campus classroom team and the 50th um, anniversary of Independence Committee um, here at the university for organizing this event. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Morris for his introduction, uh, the Deputy Dean, uh, Dr. Connell, for being MC tonight. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Adams, um, thank you. I think you did a fantastic job of giving us a very clear um, and comprehensive overview of a problem like OBC, which really I think is one of the greatest dangers to us as a society. And it, it's often just slips under the radar. Um, and I hope that our discussions about what are the potential ways forward has inspired everybody to go home and figure out what part you can play in tackling this epidemic. So thank you all and good night. <laughs>